Hello and welcome to Fatima TV. I'm John Veneri from Catholic Family News. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Chris Ferrara. We are under the lamp lights in Rome. We're doing this at night because it was tonight where October 24th, when the Synod released its final document. Now, um, these, the, the, hot bit, the hot button issues that were in the spotlight, the Casper proposal that was going to allow divorced and remarried people to receive the Eucharist, and also the very soft, um, troublesome approach to homosexuality. Those two, those two hot button issues, it seems there has been a bit of a retreat. It seems like they are taking a different approach, a more cautious approach. But there are other things in this document that you need to know about that can work tremendous mischief in the future. And Chris is going to, Chris is going to lay it out for us. Well, first of all, when you read tomorrow the conservative normalist commentators telling you that traditionalist commentators were alarmists about this document and the sky is not falling, everything's hunky-dory. Don't listen to them. They haven't read the document. We have it here. It's available only in Italian. To read the key passages in this document, most of which occur in the third section, which is the most problematic, is to understand what happened here. The enemy, the progressivists, who tried to control the synod from beginning to end, have taken two steps forward, but only one step back. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a net and very significant advance for the progressivist agenda. Let's begin with paragraph 84 which passed by a vote of 187 to 72. 180 votes were needed for passage. And in this paragraph, there's talk of how the divorced and remarried, people living in adultery, must be better integrated into parish life. And in discussing what they mean by integration, the majority that passed this provision speak of forms of exclusion. Mm -hmm. Oh, the church is just so mean. Well, that's, that's the type of terminology that's used. Exclusion is a rhetorical term that make the church look like it is unjust in its treatment of divorced and remarried people. And the forms of exclusion that they're referring to are in the field of liturgy, uh, doctrine, and education, those three areas, meaning they want divorced and remarried people to read the scriptures at mass in the, in the, uh, that's the field of liturgy in the field of doctrine they want divorced and remarried people to read religion teachers uh, and, and in the field of uh, liturgy they want the uh, divorced and remarried people to be godparents yes. so they want divorced and remarried people people living in adultery as Christ himself said as the church has always taught for 2,000 years to be there standing at the baptismal font and saying oh yes we renounce Satan and all his works and then they go home and resume their adulterous relations absolutely obscene well and this is, but this is exactly what Francis wanted yes before the Synod he was saying why can't they be godparents why can't they be religion instructors uh, you know why can't they read the gospel at mass in other words why can't they be everything mm -hmm. as if they had no problem as if they weren't living in a state of adultery and, and except it, for Holy Communion it legitimizes the, the lifestyle it legitimizes the adulterous union to a point but also uh, as we see in this document there is no mention of sinful behavior there's no talk about sexual sins or sin or sinful behavior sin is mentioned in passing that Christ has saved man from sin that type of thing but you know homosexuality uh, uh, cohabitation adultery no mention of sin whatsoever no but just various forms of behavior and where the divorced and remarried are concerned well they had, they've had this unfortunate incident in their yeah. lives but certainly can't call them adulterers any longer because if they were well then how could they stand at a baptismal font and say we renounce satan and I mean, this, they're living just as satan wants them to live that's the absurdity of this well this is this is what shows this document is is basically a modernist document because uh, one, of the th one of the things you have to know about modernism is not what is said, but what they fail to say, what they purposely leave out. And what they have purposely le le left out, as we said, is any reference to sinful behavior, mortal sins that send souls to hell. And then in paragraph 85, in this paragraph they, they did what Cardinal Schoenborn did, and others have done during the press conferences. They twisted, b beyond its proper uh, interpretation, paragraph 84 of Familiaris Consortio, where John Paul II speaks of discernment of different situations. Some spouses are the victims of abusive husbands who have dumped them and left for another woman and so on and so forth. But that discernment is not for the purpose of admitting anyone to the sacraments because in the same paragraph he says they cannot be admitted to the sacraments no matter what because their situation objectively contradicts the relationship between Christ and his church and to allow it would throw the faithful into confusion and error. He shut the door on that but they pretend that he opened the door to it. Yeah, and they continue yes. to twist paragraph 84 
of Familiaris Consortio into a discernment that would suggest that somewhere down the line the people who are divorced and remarried, living in adultery, could receive Holy Communion. Yeah, and they're determined to do it, too. The Synod is not over. The issues are not over. They're going to keep going. So It'll go be ahead. a continuous Synod, because yes. now we have the Synodal Church, yeah, we have the synodal as church, Francis yes. had announced to us last week. Yes. <laughs> then this paragraph 86, that passed by 190 to 64, and this paragraph introduces that insidious concept of the internal forum, clearly suggesting that somehow, in the internal forum, one could be blameless for living in an adulterous relationship because it was just oh so difficult of course there are difficult situations yeah. but the objective reality is difficult situations do not justify immoral behavior if that were the case then the church could excuse all sins of any kind mm -hmm. I had to murder my mother-in-law she was driving me crazy <laughs> I mean what what can't you excuse yeah. or at least diminish in terms of culpability so there's a discussion here in paragraph 86 about discussions with local pastors According to the orientation of the bishop yeah. about the further integration of the divorced and married into the life of the church, stopping short of saying that they would receive Holy Communion as a result of these discussions. But there's good news in this paragraph, at least it cites John Paul II's teaching in paragraph 34 of Familiaris Consortio that where the moral law is concerned, this idea that there could be graduality you'll gradually come to accept the law while you're receiving Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. You'll gradually consider whether you're going to stop committing mortal sin while you receive Holy Communion. That was rejected emphatically by John Paul II, paragraph 34, Familiaris Consortio. And here in paragraph 86, the Synod Majority at least says that there is no graduality of the moral law. But that would contradict the rest of the document. And so we have another pig's breakfast on our hands, yes. a document that says yes yeah. and no at yeah. the same time. But it affirms in one place, it denies in another. Yeah. Then, then there's the issue of <clears throat> uh, this ridiculous moral ecumenism, which was introduced in the Instrumentum Laboris, where we no longer say that people are living in sin, we no longer say that they're uh, living immorally because they're, they're shacked up, to use the vulgar colloquialism, or because they're divorced and remarried and, and living in adultery. No, we no longer use that language. Now we practice moral ecumenism. Just as all religions are more or less good, see all the good elements in Hinduism, and hot and tot worship, and so <laughs> yeah, forth. Yeah. Now we see the good elements in these irregular relationships. The, even, the, the phrase is even used in paragraph 69 that these people living in these irregular relations do not possess the fullness of the sacrament. Yeah. And what sort of nonsense is that? You either have a sacramental marriage or you don't. It is impossible to possess yeah, I mean, part of the sacrament. Yeah, I mean, they're talking about cohabitation here. Cohabitation. Yes. So now, now we're, we're expected to believe that people living in sin really aren't living in sin. They're just living in an imperfect arrangement which possesses part of the sacrament the way other religions possess part of the truth. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And yet this is going to be the new language yeah, sure going yes. forward. And then there's the opening to sex education in paragraph 58. Just as we see in the Instrumentum Laboris, this document passed overwhelmingly, 247 to 14, in paragraph 58, says that the family, while having a privileged place for pedagogy, cannot be the only place for sex education. This is not an option, according to the majority. Mm -hmm. It can't be the only place. There must now be sex education outside of the family meaning classroom sex education, yes. and as we know, the Catholic classroom sex education courses, oh, we've all had experience. Parents have been fighting this for, through the 80s, through the 90s. They're filth. They're, they're filth. Um, the, uh, the diocese and the Monsignors, they just run the parents through the shredder, and now Francis's Vatican has given them more ammunition to fight parents. Well, I, I was involved in a case in Florida where parents tried to opt their children into a sex education class in Catholic school, and they were expelled. The case went to court, there was TV coverage of it, the news reporter had some of the material in front of her. It was so filthy, she could not read this Catholic sex education material on the camera. She had to stop short at certain passages, she could not read them aloud. That's how disgusting it was. And this paragraph 58 says, children, meaning adolescents and those in puberty, must now be educated about the beauty of sexuality in love. In other words, taught about sexuality, yeah, sexual activity. The mechanics of it all. And uh, at a time, too, when they need to avoid the occasions of sin, not have these images and not have these temptations thrown at them, because we know that the sense object stimulates the sense appetite. Well, when, what, what Pius XI condemned when he said they dared to suggest that there should be 
classroom sex, sex education is now no longer a suggestion. Now they dare to say it's essential and mandatory and the family cannot be the only place where this is conducted. And Absolutely revolutionary. Yes. And so this is what we have here. So anyway, we better wrap this up because it's getting late. There's more to talk about. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have to keep in mind, too, is that the purpose of the synods is to keep the uh, continuous adjournamento alive. Um, I have a book, uh, the, the, uh, the biographer of, of John Paul II, and he says that is the purpose of the Synod, to continue the work of Vatican II into the future. Yeah, the and liberals are not... That, and that's what we're seeing here. The Synodal Church, the continuous aggiornamento, and the constant, really, evolution of doctrine and evolution of pastoral practice. Yeah, it, it's definitely two steps forward, another step, but only one step back, so another step forward for the post-conciliar revolutionaries. They've made a gain here, and when you look at the press coverage tomorrow, they will be saying that. It won't just be spin, they'll have reason to believe that. So anyway, uh, that's all for tonight, and uh, we hope to do another video for you tomorrow. John Veneri, Chris Ferreira for Fatima TV, signing off from Rome.